Hi everyone, I'm Eric Ronald, a Principal Consultant with SRK. I'm going to talk a bit about internal audits and peer reviews for geological and resource block models. If you like this video presentation, be sure to subscribe to the channel to get any sort of updates in the future for new videos. Uh, hit the like button, and as always, I'd love to hear and see some of your comments and questions. All right, let's get going. So this presentation is titled Conducting Internal Audits and Peer Reviews for Geological and Resource Block Models. So I'm going to provide some guidance, talk about some pitfalls, and discuss one case history. So why do we even need to do this? Uh, pretty basic question, but awfully important. So the biggest reason is to avoid costly errors. Uh, we also want to identify problems or issues before these models are rolled out or used for mine planning or for other purposes. Um, there's a lack of resource modeling standards really in most companies. Um, standards are a tough one when it comes to resource and geologic models. You don't want to be too stringent or prescriptive. Uh, you need flexibility, but standards are important to maintain quality. A side effect of doing internal audits and peer reviews is really to share knowledge between peers, coworkers, uh, people between different operations or slightly different backgrounds, experience levels. Um, and, and it really helps individuals, especially the modelers themselves. Now we all know we're going to be externally audited again at some point. So why not do it in a safe environment with coworkers, with colleagues internally where the repercussions can be taken or are not really there. Um, you know, findings can be corrected before they're rolled out. There's always time and budget constraints. That's a big reason why we do some of this stuff. When there are time constraints or budget constraints or resource constraints, shortcuts have to be taken. But it's very important to understand our shortcuts result in material problems. It's also good to understand, well, is the work compliant or is it aligned with accepted standards of reporting? If this model is going to be used for reporting of mineral resources on a public exchange, does it meet all the criteria? And the old adage, two heads are better than one, fresh eyes, uh, different opinions, different philosophies, then tends to make products better. Um, there's just different ways of doing it. And sometimes coming up with a compromise, you end up with a better product. And again, I think there really is opportunities to share, learn, and make the process of a peer review or eternal audit not a bad thing, but an opportunity to learn and really improve quality. So I mentioned time, budget, expertise, throw in resources as well. You know, this is this is life. Um, you know, there's no other way around it. Um, I always love this this triangle diagram or this tertiary diagram of time, quality, and cost. Well, you can pick two and you kind of figure out where you are within that. So one way to improve the quality at a relatively low cost and as well as not a huge time constraint is by bringing in a peer review. And the, the image on the left pretty much speaks for itself. You know, things often start very detailed, very fantastic, but budgets overrun, time starts to get constrained, deadlines get uh, get too close, and then everybody starts hurrying up and getting quick and you see the result. So really what makes a good peer reviewer? Um, you know, th there's a lot of different uh, skill sets. There's a lot of different expertise, um, but here are some key ones that, that I think are important. Um, one of the biggest one is just expertise and experience. Um, you have to have a peer reviewer who knows what they're doing. They've had to have created uh, geologic and resource block models before. They should have at least some general idea of the deposit and the ore body that you're working on. Um, but you know, there's also some other bits that go with that as well. Um, a key item of a peer review, it really should be a peer. It should not be a boss to a subordinate. There shouldn't be employment consequences if you as a subordinate peer review your boss's model and find out it's rubbish. And next thing you know, you get a bad review on your annual review or whatever. Um, so, you know, those those are things that that have to be uh, have to be looked at from an overall big picture. Um, I think an auditor or reviewer really needs to be knowledge on, knowledgeable on, on the economic geology of that deposit or deposit type, but they also need to understand what it takes to do data analyses, geostatistics, understand how you assess risk and perform risk assessments, and know the reporting guidelines in which you're working in. And this, this may be a 43101 or a JORC, uh, depending, you know, SAMREC or, or whatnot, uh, depending on where you, where you are. 
Uh, there's a saying, auditors need to be heartless and trusting souls. Well, I don't think that's entirely untrue, actually. Obviously not truly heartless and untrusting, but they do need to be able to be independent. And I think they need to be able to be constructive, but hurting one's feelings, telling them that their model has issues, that should not be part of it. Um, there is a problem and a larger cultural problem if we're worried about uh, hurting one's feelings. Anyway, uh, so, you know, the person who's reviewing really needs to be detail oriented. They can't be somebody who's distracted by 30 things at one time or always on the phone or can't sit down for 10 minutes straight. They need to really be able to provide that sufficient time to go through it. Um, you know, it's there's no such thing as just a quick peer review. It's really engagement from the process, uh, ideally from the beginning of when the modeling starts and touch points along the way. They need to be part of the process, though obviously not in depth as the actual modeler themselves. Again, I talked about honesty that, you know, that keeps coming back and back. Um, that's a very important thing. Often what works best is you don't have an individual peer reviewer. Um, is usually a small group of people. Uh, this kind of spreads spreads the uh, the resources about and the time constraints as well. Um, and, and sometimes you need a, uh, a specific person like a geostatistician and you need a specific geologist and you need a special risk of person to kind of come together and lend all those skills to the team. So really an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about in the next few slides um, <clears throat> is, is really looking at audit and peer review a model. And, and I think you should go through it as if you were creating it. Obviously follow those steps. Don't start with the mineral resources at the end and say, let's check that to make sure it's okay. I think it makes more sense for, for the workflow to start at the beginning. And when I mean the beginning, I mean the big picture. So really understand what are the assurance guidances and what are the big picture requirements the company needs for this model? What's it gonna be used for? What are the implications for it? Is this just an exploration geologic model to try to look at targeting and, and get some ideas on you know, what, uh, what kind of deposit type you're looking at? Or is this something that uh, is gonna have a FS based on it? So by starting at the beginning, what I mean by that, fundamental data. So this is the, uh, the standard inputs, <clears throat> drilling data, um, usually drilling data, but a lot of times it's, it's mapping, it could be channel samples, trenches, could be a lot of different things. Garbage in, garbage out. Enough said on that one. If, if what you put in there does not hold water, <laughs> then all the assumptions and all the further work going downstream from that is not gonna be very good. Uh, subjectivity and interpretation, uh, this is a bit of a tricky problem. We'll touch on this here shortly. Um, next steps, typically looking at uh, really diving deep into the data. This would be exploratory data analysis, model construction, along with looking at statistics, geostatistics, estimation, and so forth. Um, and then obviously the validation is critical and documentation is absolutely critical. Throughout this whole process, one of the key aspects for a peer review or a general audit is to always, always question the status quo and any sort of mythologies. And what I mean by mythologies is these are those sort of unspoken truths that you see within company cultures is you, you never challenge Bob on anything he says around geology because he's been doing it since before you were born. Those are the type of mythologies and the status quo that can lend, lead to uh, big problems to say the least. <clears throat> so now the foundation of geologic and resource block models is really that input data. This in most cases is starts with a drill hole database. Um, this is the, the fundamentals that if it's wrong, contains errors or full of gaps, it's going to result in really a weak underlying base or foundation. And it's going to present some very high risk. As I mentioned before any downstream decisions made based on this model, and this could be either an estimation, but especially on reserves, mine planning, economic analyses, could be based on fundamentally flawed assumptions if your drill hole database has errors in it. So I've listed a series of items that are typically done, um, you know, depending on the depth of the peer review, I don't recommend these for everything. Some of these are, are more akin to external audits as far as like checking the data. But again, depending on the data and the use, um, I think to, it's good to do these things internally first before you get uh, an independent view. So next we look at the geological model. Now this is where things can be a little bit more difficult simply because in the geologic model we're dealing in a lot of cases around subjectivity and interpretation. Um, now with that any two geologists a lot of times will have different opinions um, but if your 
data, uh, sorry, if your deposit is data rich, uh, meaning there's a lot of data, uh, this is mapping, drilling, combination of, of multiple data sets, then that interpretation will hopefully start to work itself out and have a lot of overlap and consistency. Um, so you know, really slightly behind that clean database, I think the interpretation is, is probably the next most critical step because this is the decision that you're making on your grouping uh, of your data. This is how you put it together spatially. Um, you know, this has consequences on domains and estimations and a lot of other work that goes on. <clears throat> it really should incorporate all available data. Uh, hopefully you do have more than drill holes. So hopefully there's mapping, some geophysics, geochem, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that goes into it. Um, you know, this is really where you start to get a lot of benefit from bringing in, in outside people, um, getting in, bringing people in with different backgrounds. The argument of bringing the mine geologist and the exploration geologist, somebody who's a born pessimist and someone who's a born optimist in there and sort of duke it out and kind of work things out usually ends up with a, a better geologic interpretation. Um, so one of the biggest pitfalls that I see with the geologic model is simply is blind trust. Oftentimes you'll have, uh, you know, the uh, don't worry, I'm a crusty old geologist. I've been here forever, been doing this since before you were in nappies. Uh, you know, trust me, don't question anything. This is my interp. So this is where things can absolutely go horribly wrong. Um, you know, it is critical that the peer reviewer is allowed to question these things. And I think it's a it's a it's a, an important aspect of it. They have to question and challenge this sort of status quo. So how do you audit? A geologic model is, is you know, really is um, if you can put it in a different software than what it was created, that's great. But uh, at a minimum, you, you put it in, you start spinning it around in 3D, look at it different ways, cut it in cross sections, level pans, um, oblique angles across it. Does it make geologic sense? Is it just a big blob around, you know, high grade copper? But we don't know how it got there, why it's there, what the host units are, how is it structurally controlled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It needs to have a uh, connection back to the ore body genesis of the formation. It, it needs to adhere to simple geologic principles. Um, you know, I, it's important that the units that are modeled, if you're doing a full lithologic um, model, which is which is always recommended, but not always uh, able to do with time and budget, is that it goes all the way back to original or pre-mining topography, just for completeness. Um, you know, checking those intercepts, the drill hole intercepts, going back and checking the logs, making sure that where things are domained and high grade is actually where the high grade is. Um, you know, starting to make, just put it all together. Does it make any sense? Um, and, and these are some of the best things that you can do in trying to read a model. So structure is a huge part, obviously, of interpretation and geologic models. Um, you know, more often than not, when I am performing independent or external audits uh, or due diligence, I encounter issues with a lack of a structural understanding of a mineralized ore body. Um, it's, it's a bit unfortunate um, that there's no structural model or it hasn't really been looked at that much or, you know, it's only the geotech's issue or, or, or some kind of, you know, closed-minded ideas like that. Um, there are really some key questions to ask when it comes to structural controls on models because with most metal deposits, as well as, um, you know, actually a lot of non-metal or bulk other deposits, structural controls are absolutely critical. Um, so how critical is it? Do people actually understand what role structure plays? Um, does the local structure actually drive with the regional structure? Meaning that if you understand what sort of physiographic province you're in, taking a big step back, uh, Google Earth style, um, and you understand the structural regime is, is does the micro scale of being just the deposit fit with the regional scale? Those are important things. Um, has there been any mapping done, uh, both in pit, near the pit, on a regional scale? How is that incorporated? Is it not? And then simply, is anybody talking to the geotech, right? Most, most uh, operations at least, um, or advanced projects, uh, geotechnical engineers have, uh, you know, they live and die by the structure. And so, you know, has anybody from the geology side really worked hand in hand with it? Uh, maybe they have some sort of rudimentary structural model that needs to be incorporated. So a good example of was, is structure important? Um, so this is a case study from a, a structurally controlled ore body. Uh, the red lines on here represent some of the faults. And you look at this and go, wow, yeah, that's pretty important. If you had drill holes going through here, 
that um, you know didn't give you a good outline of where mineralization in this case looks is, uh, is colored in blue you know it's absolutely controlled by the structure and in some cases there's minor offsets some cases there's large offsets um, you know understanding the attitude the displacement uh, and the trends of the structure absolutely leads you and tells you where uh, where the mineralization is and whether we have areas of uh, larger volumes or reduced volumes or truncated volumes so in a case like this yes absolutely critical get your structural skeleton sorted out first and then start doing your model. so uh, the next step that we're going to start diving into is looking at this is more uh, data conditioning uh, this usually starts with data compositing um, the key here is really the introduction of biases or dilutions in, uh, in, in data before you even start estimating. So um, data compositing is one of the first steps. Uh, you don't want to potentially start adding biases initially uh, or at all really for that matter. Um, so often compositing rigor is skipped uh, simply because a lot of times people don't give it much interest or or don't much, not much effort um, but you know incorrect methods or philosophies of compositing can really result in biased or diluted data set before you even use it within estimation um, so I've got a few uh, questions on here that I think are always good ones to ask and just understand is you know how you know what are the methods that are being done what's the rationale behind the size of the composite that's being selected does it make any sense um, has it been reviewed against whatever the selective mining unit or SMU is what are the main pitfalls that I tend to see um, when I do see issues with data compositing is when when folks decide to composite either too large and they dilute out everything both the good grade and the bad deleterious stuff and everything just kind of goes to the mean and you hope it's above cutoff grade but it's not really giving you that spatial variability you need uh, in order to have a good mine plan or folks cross geological hard boundaries in which they shouldn't and then you result with this sort of imaginary low-grade halo that doesn't actually exist it's just a product of the way that folks have done their compositing and domaining so a few key things to take look out for so exploratory data analysis or uh, or EDA uh, such a critical part of um, any sort of peer review and and I really encourage people who do peer reviews or internal audits to actually get their hands dirty in the data analysis this is where it helps to have you know uh, a, a good resource geologist or kind of a statistician person um, on uh, on the peer review or on a peer review team uh, I honestly believe that one of the best ways to understand the robustness of domains, the behavior of the data, outliers in the grade, uh, low grade pods, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is really to perform a detailed exploratory data analysis on this. Um, a good peer reviewer will approach this systematically and likely find out a lot about the model that uh, many geologists or the modelers might not have actually realized before simply because they need to pull everything apart and start looking at this a few different ways. Um, you know, the pitfall that, that I have come across on occasion, this one is really that paralysis through analysis, where sometimes people are just into it way too much and they start going down rabbit holes and start looking at outliers a bit too much and weeks go by and a lot of hours are spent and wasted. Um, but really, ultimately, you want to say is, OK, are your domains stationary or pretty close to stationary? Are they robust? Do they make sense? And, uh, and have you been able to put things into the right groupings that you want in order to get a good estimate? So variography and estimation, um, you know, we move into this stage next. And, and this is one where I see a lot of issues with, I think, smaller companies or groups um, where this tends to prove a bit challenging simply because there's a lot of cases a general lack of knowledge across the industry especially within North America on appropriate use of variography and different methods of, of estimation um, you know not getting this right can really result in this sort of black box syndrome where you put in a you put in B and something comes out we're not really sure what actually happens um, and then if you're in a situation like that where there's not a qualified person uh, and what I mean qualified is just somebody who's knowledgeable and experienced in, in this uh, in this discipline is don't be afraid to bring in an outside expert. Um, I think it's going to be really worth it. Um, you know, anyway, th this is one of those that it, it can make a lot of difference in some ore bodies, uh, other ore bodies. Um, you know, the, the things don't just hold together that well. Um, really, the geology is, is, is one of the biggest ones that, uh, that control this. Um, 
I always like to make sure that any sort of work on the geostat side has root within geology and it makes good geologic sense. Um, uh, the great Harry Parker quote that uh, I love to use many times is the ounce of geology is worth a pound of geostats that, you know, you can get quite complex with mathematical techniques of estimation and data manipulation. But fundamentally, you know, we're talking about geology and trying to interpret, interpret geology. It needs to make some sense in this. Um, some of the pitfalls uh, I mentioned already so this can be a general lack of understanding. Um, I've also seen the opposite where a company is excited to start looking at nonlinear techniques of estimation. They might be really thrilled to look at some different simulation. And I think that's a fantastic attitude, but sometimes they'll bring in consultants or outside folks, experts who um, have their own sort of pet projects and, and they always do the same thing, whether the fundamental data says it's worth it or not. And uh, so anyway, let's probably have a whole presentation just on that. So next we looked, uh, you know, a little deeper into specifically into into variography. What's it actually showing you? Um, you know, variography is just a, a tool to understand the spatial continuity of a particular element or variable within a, a, a domain. So the keys here are really is, is can you get robust variography? Can you get a quality model with quality structure? Does it hold together? Um, you know, if the domain is robust and appropriately, you know, or approximately stationary, um, and, and a well-modeled variogram can really tell you a lot about the behavior of data within that domain. Um, most geostatisticians worth their weight can, can really calculate a good variogram and they can tell you exactly what the neighborhood should be and should not be and how well the estimation may perform. Um, you know, once, once you kind of understand that spatial continuity, that helps inform um what happens next which is essentially your your search neighborhood the estimation and some of the validation um you know if if you can get a good quality variogram that's that's key um if you cannot that's where some of the problems uh and pitfalls that i see is you know where where people try to use a lot of um, other tools to uh, uh try to improve it but fundamentally there's probably a lack of continuity within that um I also see folks, this is kind of an odd one. I see people using variography, uh, or sorry, calculating variography, um, but then reverting to a very simplified estimation technique like an inverse distance weighting. Well, after you go through all the trouble of doing all that and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so when you see things like that kind of question is, well, do, they, do they really understand what they're doing? Um, it is very easy. Uh, in some cases to perform data masking, fudging your lags, uh, doing different types of transforms and other manipulations to the underlying data to really improve and improved, to, uh, sorry, to get an improved, well-structured uh, semivariogram. Now, all these techniques, they are legitimate, they are warranted at times and they can improve estimation, um, but it can also be a way if people don't really know what they're doing is a way of kind of making it look like the spatial continuity is better than in the actual underlying spatial continuity. So a few pitfalls, or it's good to, you know, have somebody in that peer review group who, who knows what they're looking at. Uh, as I mentioned, the search neighborhood, that's really the next. And, you know, using an appropriate subset of data to inform your block, uh, it's really an important step in your estimation, right? The, these are the data that's going to inform and give you the estimate of that grade um, or, or that variable within the block. So, you know, you want to be sure that your parameters uh, that you select actually make sense. Um, whether using hard boundaries, soft boundaries in the domain, uh, how many samples do you use, the min, the max, do you have enough, do you have too many to inform the estimate, and then what understanding what those consequences of, of both, using too many versus too little samples, um, as well as large searches versus, um, you know, isotropic searches versus omnidirectional searches, so on and so forth. Um, the orientations can absolutely be key and, and definitely need to be reviewed. Um, some of the big pitfalls I see is, is people just saying, well, that's what they did last time, so I'm just going to do it again. Well, that doesn't, that kind of dogma doesn't really fly. You know, you really need to understand and, and make sure that it's an appropriate search neighborhood or your estimate will be, will be flawed. Um, so key pitfalls, um, you know, different, 
the search neighborhood, sorry, the search ellipsoid is probably one of the biggest pitfalls that I see simply because different software packages out there are notorious for using various orientation nomenclature that are not consistent and it drives everyone in the resource geology space absolutely crazy. So be sure that you can visualize your search ellipsoid right on top of or next to your data and your domains in 3D and you can spin it around to make darn sure that your search actually aligns with the domain, not only the size, but the orientation, any sort of anisotropies that are in there, and that it makes geological sense. It's not shooting out to the moon um, and potentially getting negative grades, and it's not just a little beach ball that's gonna pl uh, populate things. Um, it's important, important things that can add bias. Uh, so these are, these are key things that if you don't dive into the details of the search neighborhood, you can miss. So the next bit, estimation and validation. So too often we see people go from one extreme to the other with estimation, I find. Um, there, there may be a history at your operation or your deposit or the previous version of the, uh, the model where they used, say, inverse distance weighting squared, which is a popular one, um, which actually may or may not be entirely appropriate, but they need to be checked. Um, and so, you know, they just keep using it over and over and over. But the key is to run different types of estimates, and this can be inverse distance weighting to various powers, one, two, or three. Don't go over three. Uh, it's too close to nearest neighbor after that. Uh, use ordinary Krieging, or you know, if it warrants it, or if you're comfortable in that space, start looking at other nonlinear techniques that may improve the estimate. Once you have multiple estimates, you can run validation using those and start to understand which one makes the most sense which one gives you the better local and global estimate. And sometimes there's combinations depending on domains and obviously it can get quite complex. So when you're auditing something like this, it's important to ask what other methods were trialed. Why was the ultimate one that was selected selected? And what did they see? So common ways of validation of all these different methods and, and decision on selecting the most appropriate estimation techniques. Obviously visual validation, uh, we see the picture down at the bottom, making sure that where we have high grade in our data, uh, we see high grade within the model and it's appropriately either smoothed or conditionally biased or how much local variability you have versus how much averaging over uh, the, the global domain. Um, these are important things. Um, swath plots are, are critical in, in multiple directions. Um, there's a lot of other type of, of validations, um, but, but these are the most common ones. Also looking at, you know, different, the, the changes in distribution of the data, uh, the means, I could go on and on, but it, it needs to be looked at several different, different ways here. Um, I look at validation during construction of a model really as an iterative process where you check, you kind of refine, I don't like that, I'm gonna tweak that, the neighborhood needs to be adjusted, assuming like a QKNA wasn't, wasn't performed, um, and ultimately getting to the point where the estimator is happy with the results on that, using all those different techniques. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So, you know, validation and verification of all this data, ideally, if you're lucky enough to be working with a producing or operating mine site, you wanna use reconciliation. So when we talk about truth and reconciliation, that is about the closest thing to truth you can have. Um, you would like your new model to reconcile better than your previous model. That's a best test of saying how good is your model. Um, reconciliation can be fraught with issues though. Um, you know, you, you, you really need to start with a spatial reconciliation, but oftentimes uh, I do see operations where they just don't do a good job um, in, in reconciliation. Um, but I think it's important for an auditor to review this. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very critical step um, if you have robust reconciliation. Um, when you just have annual reconciliation or annual reconciliation just with tons and it's a large operation, um, a lot of issues and a lot of sins can be hidden by too many tons, everything gets smoothed out and essentially it ends up just everything kind of averaging out over time and looking okay. That doesn't really help you too much. 
So classification, classification is a big one. Um, you know, really peer reviewing and auditing classification can be very tricky. Ultimately, it's the QP's opinion on relative risk. So from a peer review or internal audit standpoint, this, this can be an odd one to sort of challenge, but I think there are some fundamental aspects that need to be looked at. Um, you know, it's important to check the alignment with, say, CIM standards or JORC definitions on measured, indicated, and inferred, of course, and to make sure everything's aligned uh, with those definitions, as well as not being classified as, as, as well. Um, you need to make sure that the items that are used to inform the different types of classifications is more than just drill spacing. And that's a, a pitfall that you see all too often. It needs to be a holistic view of everything that goes into the model up to this point. So this includes geologic understanding, complexity of the ore body, uh, data spacing is important, um, the quality of the data, QAQC, robustness of the data, spatial continuity, so on and so forth. Um, so really, all that needs to be understood, and importantly, it needs to be explained and justified and ideally just laid out very simple. And the reason for selection of what makes the difference between measured, what makes the difference between an indicated, and so forth. Um, and really, what seems reasonable as well. Um, you can have QPs who are a bit more conservative versus a bit more liberal, and, uh, you know, as long as it's reasonable, that's... You know, again, it's hard to challenge, but it needs to make some sense. Um, the way that it's coded in the actual model needs to make sure that that can be recreated. Often wireframes are used, but sometimes there's scripting or combination of the two. Um, one of the key aspects of classification, and most QPs will tell you right up, is whether they've been pressured by management to achieve some sort of predetermined outcome. Now, if you need to have a certain amount of tons at a certain grade in order to have the rate of return hit some sort of internal threshold, and the QP is made aware of that and either lightly or heavily pressured by management to achieve that, that can absolutely skew things. So those are important things. And when we talk about honesty, uh, transparency, those are absolutely key because that can get everyone in trouble, that's for sure. Uh, some of the pitfalls that I see on classification is where it's either, it's going one way or the other with subjectivity versus quantitative parameters. So what I mean by that is it is just the QP's gut feeling that everything on the Western high wall is always inferred no matter what you do, but there's really not much data backing it. Or alternatively, um, somebody doesn't really understand the geology very much, but they're relying entirely on conditional simulation outputs and some of the post-processing um, quantitative risk that goes into that to use that as a sole parameter of within certain criteria that has to be measured um, and that has to meet inferred and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's where things can be kind of messy. Um, you also should not see uh, individual blocks sitting by themselves where you have a inferred block that's surrounded amongst a sea of measured is not real that doesn't make any sense and vice versa for that matter so these are some of the key things to have a look at as as a peer review so documentation um you know documentation should always be part of any peer review and audit um, there's really no point in reviewing all the technical work if you cannot communicate it clearly and concisely um, simple like to say is if it's not documented it didn't happen uh, pitfalls, this is just human nature and laziness. A lot of times we're so busy, uh, you know, or we don't like writing or whatever it might be. And people just skip over the details. The documentation is too short, it doesn't exist, or it's out of date. Uh, an update was done over some weekend. No one ever bothered to write it up, so on and so forth. And obviously that, that does not cut it. So a little bit of a case history as I've kind of walked through all the different uh, aspects of, of kind of peer reviewing a geological and a resource block model is, you know, this was um, uh, this was a review that I was a part of uh, quite a long time ago, but it was it was just a North American operation. Um, the commodity uh, of this one is, is not important, but basically it was a, a geological and a block model 
that went through a regular series of auditing. There were basically um, updates on an annual basis due to new uh, new blast hole data, new uh, resource drilling, plus pit mapping and things of that nature. So there was enough data. Every year, model got updated. That's fine. Um, each time it did it, it went through some peer reviews. So uh, it had gone through two seasons of this, of internal peer reviews. And yep, everything all looks good. Everyone's fine. Big thumbs up, smiles, uh, go on about your day. So in the third year, the company said, all right, well, this time we're going to shake it up and we're going to go get an external reviewer. So brought in a third party uh, consultant and not to do too much detail, but just high level, just kind of have a sniff test, look at a fatal flaw level uh, audit in the third year. So the findings are quite interesting. So as soon as you brought in an independent party, those things of sta questioning the status quo and being honest and looking at company internal mythologies and such, that goes out the window because it doesn't apply for independent auditors, right? So some of the issues that they had found on this particular operation, well, there was fundamental rock coding problems. It had been logged, the drilling had been logged over many generations and many campaigns um, going back about 25 years where there was a lot of inconsistency on how the basic rock or the lithologic codes were being coded. Well, that led right into the geologic interpretation that led into domaining and so on, um, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, the model was never actually built back to original topography. It was built back to, uh, you know, the pit shell at that time. This was an open pit operation. And you ended up just running into some issues and incompleteness and actually being able to uh, bring it back to original topography. Uh, not a, f a huge flaw, but this was you know, basically a problem because what was happening is the domains that were up closer near the surface, uh, near the pit shell, it was not using the historic data that was perfectly relevant, but it had been excluded. Uh, another finding was the QAQC program was basically insufficient. Um, it didn't collect enough samples. Uh, if I recall, it didn't use certified standards and it didn't use the most appropriate blanks. So there were some questions with some of the analytics in there. Um, when you started diving into the drill hole database, there were errors, there were issues. Variography hadn't been updated in a couple of years, so it wasn't actually looking at all the data that was there. Um, there were some other minor issues with exploratory data analysis and estimation. You kind of get the point. This was from a fatal flaw level. So what the heck happened? The year before, everybody got the thumbs up internally, and we bring in these consultants, and they find all the stuff. So what's going on? Are these just, you know, evil consultants that came in, or you know, what happened? So, you know, really, what happened was the internal peer reviews were too high level. It was done over the course of a couple of days after the model was already done, and pretty much no time was spent on any of the details or the raw data. Uh, nobody could be bothered to actually open up the database and start doing some of those basic checks. There was not enough time. The people who were assigned uh, as the auditors, it was a small team, they were geologists, which was, that's a good place to start. They were geologic experts. These guys were not resource geologist. They were not geostatisticians. They had not even made a model before. They were used to uh, somebody else making the model for them. Um, and they would just take a look at it and say, yeah, yeah, that looks fine. So they didn't even know how to even open some of the software and, and check these things. Um, and in fact, you know, they, they didn't even have the ability to spin it in 3D, as I mentioned before. And really too much was trusted. Um, you know, really the, the way that it was approached, well, the the individual who made it he had been on the site a very very long time very sharp very bright very good geologist and well you know he's been there forever he knows what he's doing i'm sure it's fine we're not going to waste our time by diving into the details um they also didn't really have a checklist they so you know you're talking about some geologists who are diving into the discipline of resource geology but not really understanding how it works without really anything to go off of so um you know making sure all those items were looked at questions the procedures were followed reviewed um you know without those sort of checklists those sort of reminders that grocery list of things that you should look at it's very easy to miss something so you know this is this is not an exception we do see this thing happen very often and it's it's just one of those things that happens it's some so if you are a modeler or a resource geologist somebody making these you know how do you actually make your audit next your next audit tolerable, right? Because this, this whole presentation has been about as a peer reviewer, as an internal auditor, what are the things you should do? So, you know, from the other side of the table, um, 
you know, this presentation is a good one to use to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes on how they would look at it. So the first key one, document everything you do, right? And, and really explain what you're doing, um, obviously who's doing it, but then why? Why are you selecting that? And if it's because you don't know, then write that in your documentation. Honestly, that's an important thing to flag, highlight, and come back to. You know, we're using IDW squared because, well, that's what somebody told me to do back in the 80s, and there you go. Um, things like having flowcharts of how your work flows, how your data is organized, what steps you're taking, those are important things, and that can really help understand, uh, you know, the organization of how a model is created. Um, you know, doing doing run files, those are helpful because somebody can recreate things quite quickly, and that 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 helps. Um, you know, doing screenshots in your documentation. All right, did this, did this. This is what I saw. This is what I did. You know, I always think um, it's important as as a model or a resource geologist when you're creating models is always plan for that beer truck scenario. And, and what I mean by that is somebody wins the lottery and they're gone and you never see them again. They get run over by the beer truck. You know, whatever the kind of case might be is that if you remove an individual from an organization is that organization continues to function uh, smoothly and, and someone else can come in, pick up their work, see the documentation, see what they did, reproduce it with minimal effort. And that's, that's a very important thing. If you do not have that, uh, some people become kind of data hoarders and they go, oh, this is mine. I don't want anybody else to steal my job. They become quick liabilities for the company. And that's unfortunate. So, you know, uh, start looking at conclusions here, really take a look at, uh, you know, the big picture of doing peer reviews and, and internal audits. They really need to be part of any company's mineral resource assurance policy. And these are the steps that are taken to assure that there are sound mineral resources. It's backed up by the most appropriate data. It's been looked at. Um, checks are being done, check sheets are available, documentations in order, so on and so forth. When you start the process, it is important to get a reviewer on board at the very beginning or a set of reviewers on there and keep them informed throughout the process. Now, having specific points of contact or stage gates when you say complete a certain task like reviewing the whole database, then bring them in and kind of go through it and bring them up to speed. Um, that, that helps involve everybody early on and uh, makes for a better product. Uh, I always like to say, you know, use your brain. If something doesn't make sense, whether it's geologic sense, common sense, or whatever, you know, do something about it. If you're reading this and, and you know, somebody checked the data and you're relying on somebody else, eh, and it just, that doesn't seem quite right. So just do something about it or flag it uh, with management. Uh, of course, document everything. I've kind of beaten this horse throughout the whole thing. Um, include who did, who did what and why. Um, if during the process you're identifying areas of risk, and there is not time to correct errors in the database or, or you know, things are identified, you need to be able to communicate that risk through the process. Now, some cases that will result in change of classification. Sometimes it's a matter of just flagging it for the next update. We need to drill more over here. We need to look at updating geologic model over here. We need to look at more structural work in this area. These are the sort of things that along the way to really identify this risk. And, and all of a sudden you start to build your work plan over the next year. And that's that's important thing. Um, realize there's never going to be enough time, resources, or budget to do things perfectly. There's no such thing as a perfect model. Um, but you do want to make sure your model is useful. That is that is the key. Uh, if you don't have one, make a checklist. If you don't know how, start asking people because checklists are, are important because they just give you prompts and reminders to ask the questions. Uh, somebody can probably take this presentation and, and, and kind of work a, a rudimentary checklist out of it. There are other checklists out there. Um, you know, you never want it to be a tick and flick exercise. It's not, yep, did you do it? Okay, move on. It's just asking questions and prompts to make sure everything is covered. And critical things are not missed out. So key takeaways, so if, if you've made it this far through this presentation, uh, I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> but please take these things away as I really think having the right people in the right roles um, for a peer review is key. You wanna make sure that you've got a good enough experience set and the appropriate experience so that people can question those things and actually give you good feedback. Um, honesty and independence is absolutely key. Obviously don't be mean to somebody, don't tell them their whole thing is rubbish, be constructive, um, but question everything.
uh, having organization meaning uh, not a whole bunch of dead files and all these version controls and and you know sloppy documentation that is absolutely important um, document the heck out of everything don't just blindly trust anything always question trial don't assume try things out see how they work validate it um, you know I, I don't a lot of times the word audit comes in as a negative. Um, I really think it can be, if done well, a positive learning experience for everybody involved. Really, you end up getting uh, a better work quality, a be better work product out of it. It's not about naming and shaming anybody, that's for sure. If you've got reconciliation, use it. Uh, it can provide a lot of insights into actual performance. Uh, compare that block model, but realize that it is easy to hide some sins and understand where it's appropriate to use and where it's not. Um, and, and ultimately, peer reviews make for better products. Internal peer reviews make for cheaper, better products. It's a lot cheaper than getting an external. So that's all I've got on this. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, I really hope there's some aspects or a couple learnings that you've been able to pull out of this presentation. Uh, again, go ahead and hit that like button if you if you do like this. Add some comments in there. I'd love to hear some feedback, good, bad, or, or otherwise. Constructive, though, remember. <laughs> uh, well, thanks again for your time, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.